So, uh, today actually we're starting a new series uh, called Money Talks, uh, and, and it's basically about changing the way you think about money. Now, it's fascinating, uh, uh, someone, someone uh, a friend of mine said, oh, yeah, what are you doing, what are you doing, what's the next thing we're doing, talking about money, oh, I hate it when we do that, and, and, uh, and it sort of reflects, it sort of reflects how we feel about money a lot of the times, right? And, uh, and uh, it's basically because uh, usually we expect, okay, we're going to be told to stop being greedy, right? And uh, to start being generous and, and that we are the 1% and that we should be grateful, right? <laughs> that's sort of the formula, right? And, uh, and that's, that's actually true, right? I mean, we should remember that we're 1% and we greed is bad and all of that stuff. But, but that's not the point. And also the other thing that sort of gets us when we talk about money and it's, it's this... In, in Western, modern Western American society, talking about money is a little bit of a taboo thing. Like even close, people that are relatively close, uh, they don't know each other's incomes, things like that. It's just not, it's sort of mauve it on, but like a bad, it's bad manners to ask, uh, too specific, to be too specific about money, right? And it's fascinating stuff how, it, that's how deeply cultural uh, in, in it's in our culture, right? So what we're sort of hoping to do and, we, uh, and in, in here in, in the tribe, we talk about money at least once a year. That's just sort of, we refuse to sort of cave into the taboo, right? We untaboo things here. And that's sort of the goal. Now, th this particular uh, mini-series is like three, three Sundays. We're going to talk about the why, the how, and the, uh, the, the, the why, the what, and the how of money. And the goal is really to literally sort of shift our minds, right? Start thinking about money in a, in a very different way. Now, and at the end of it, actually, on the 31st, we're going to have a, a few volunteers do a workshop about budgeting. So if you want to, if you feel like you need a, to grab a hold and manage your money a little bit better, mark in your calendars on the 31st after church, there's going to be lunch provided and things like that. We're trying to figure out locations and stuff. But we're going to, if you need help, we'll actually provide some help. We'll have some people that give you a small class, go through your line items and things like that and, and, and help you. Uh, get on a budget. How, how cool is that, right? It's going to be exciting. It's going to be inspiring, uplifting, life-changing. See, everybody's like, <laughs> yay, <laughs> budgeting. Um, but we do insist on talking about money, and the reason for that is because Jesus talked about money, right? 11 of his 39 parables are about money. One of every seven verses in the, in the Gospel of Luke is about money. Think about that, right? There's only one other thing that Jesus talked more about, personally, than money, and that's the kingdom of heaven. That's it. Those are the two topics. Those are the two main topics, the top two of Jesus' conversations with people. And the reason for that is because it's money gets to us, you know? We think about it. We think about it all the time. I catch myself driving around thinking about if we're going to make this payment or if tuition is due for one of my three kids, right? I, I, and, and what am I missing? Am I over... I mean, it's, it's, it gets... It's in your thoughts. It's sort of central, right? And, and I drive around thinking about it and going, well, you know, it's just sit down, get a piece of paper, write it down, and figure it out. Don't just think about it. But we think about it all the time. It's like a worm. Right? And that's why we hate talking about money here. And also there's this weird sort of, uh, uh, if, if, you, if you know your Plato, there's dualism, right? I don't know if you, dualism is this ancient Greek thing, and Plato basically said that everything that is from the flesh, everything that is material is evil inherently and everything that is spiritual is good, and it's sort of crept into the church, and it's still sort of in the DNA of the church. So it's sort of, why would we talk about something so lowly, so physical, so material, in a place of worship? And the truth is that's completely a misconception. That has nothing to do with reality of how Jesus talked about it or thought about it, right? So those are all the kinds of ways where we need to shift our minds. So the very first thing that Jesus said when he, right after he sort of started, officially sort of kicked off his ministry, right? He was tempted for 40 days, and then he says, the first thing he says before he starts talking anything, like there's any, before any other record 
of what he was saying, he said this, from that time on, Jesus began to preach. And this is sort of the essence of what he was preaching about all over the place. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And repent means change your mind. That is the essence of the word. Change the way you think about the world. You think about the world this way, and then you start thinking about the world this way. It's the same world. It's the same you, but you start seeing it differently, with different eyes, different heart, different perception. Does that make sense? So he's basically saying, you need to change the way you think about the world because of, of this important thing that just happened. And this important thing is, the kingdom of heaven is near. Now, what on earth does that mean? Right? So we are in this, in this tiny little place in, the, in a province of the Roman Empire, in a, in, a, in, a, in a remote place of the Roman Empire. And, and, and there's these Jewish people, and it's really sort of more or less impoverished compared to the, the capital of Rome, right? And then there's this guy comes from, a, not only, so there's, a, there's Rome, there's, you know, the, the Judean sort of province, and then within the Judean province, it's not even the central sort of place. It's not the place where things happen. It's not like in New York or the L.A. There's a Galilee. There's a Galilee. There's this, this teeny tiny little place, right? And then from that place, there's this new guy saying, everything's new. Change the way you think. Okay, that does make a lot of sense. Now, I have experience. So what does that mean? Everything is new. Change your mind. Uh, I spent about 20, over 20 years in, in Russia of my life. So I'm 46 now, over 20 years in Russia. It's a long time. A little bit over uh, like half my life, right? And then I was there when uh, there was, it was still the Soviet Union, right? And in the Soviet Union, there was like a way of being. So there were some good things. For example, I didn't have to pay for my college. Amen. No student debt. Still nice, right? I didn't have to pay for health care. Fantastic. But we would stand in line to buy good, like e even regular food, not good food, you know, just regular food. And then there would be shortages of everything, right? It was terrible. People made no money, but there was no homeless people. Or n there, were peop there, were no, uh, there were not people with, the, every everybody had a job, right? So it was a certain, and you couldn't leave the country without asking permission. And they would say no to you a lot, okay? So like you couldn't just go and check out Vegas. That, that, you know, that didn't happen. So for us here, in sort of this, uh, this different reality, this is like a normal thing. If I want to go to Vegas, I want to go to Vegas. I'll go to Vegas, get on the plane, right? If I have no money, I gotta uh, get, get a Greyhound. And I'll go to Vegas. If I want to go to Vegas, it's sort of fundamental. I'll go anywhere I want, even if it's stupid to go there. I can go there. In the Soviet Union, even if you're stupid, you couldn't go there. You just couldn't go there. Does that make sense to you? Like, let it sink in. You had to ask permission. You couldn't be entrepreneurial. You, you couldn't own a business. They would put you in jail for that. Okay? There's all kinds of things. There's like a long list of things they would put you in jail for. Long, long list. And it was this gray existence, right? This gray existence where there was no plenty and there was no lag and it was sort of in the middle, right? Like a zombie place. And then in 1991, the thing fell apart, imploded like a house of cards. And, and uh, all kinds of country, countries sort of fled, you know, the Baltic states and Ukraine and other places. It became a bunch of other countries. And then if you're still in Russia at the time, everything changed. You didn't have to ask permission to leave the country and go visit somewhere, right? You could be entrepreneurial, you can start a business. You could do anything I, you want, essentially. So everything was new, and yet nothing felt new. And it was this in-between place where you can keep living like you did before, but then you could do, if you change your mind, you can actually go to Vegas. Just go to the box office. Get some cash out. I want to go to, can I have a ticket to Vegas? Yes, you can. <laughs> really? Y you know what I mean? And I understand that most of you have no idea what that feels like, but I'm telling you, it's cr 
crazy. It is crazy. And this is, it's so, it's so I'm, giving, I'm telling you the story to tell you this other story about Jesus. And this other story about Jesus, that's what it was. Only at a cosmic level, right? Only at a cosmic level. So these, these people lived in, in Judea as a province of Rome, and, and they had a hard life, most of them, and they, had a, they were waiting for the Messiah. Those who were, who were waiting for the Messiah. And then he comes, and I said, I'm here. And he would say, I'm here. And everything is different. And they would go about their work like they did always, right? And they would do their things like they did always. And then there was this guy there going, no, 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 no. Everything is new. Start seeing the world differently. <clears throat> so this guy, Jesus, this young rabbi, he starts w- w- going around and he starts talking about stuff. Stuff that gets to us. Stuff that matters. Stuff that we think about all the time. And a lot of that is money, right? So he starts going and he starts pointing out people and telling stories and, and calling out people from the crowd. And, and he... He challenges people to change the, the, their, their mindset, and then he starts saying, like, because we would expect, we'd expect some people to do better in, new, in the new times than others, right? And he would, would challenge that all the time, like it's an upside-down kingdom sort of thing. Because he would go and talk to, let's say, the, the, the people that we think would be, the, everybody, including the apostle, thought were the, sort of the heroes, the guys, the people that had it together. Uh, like this, this rich young ruler came to Jesus and asked, what, what does it take to go into, come into heaven? And Jesus says, well, you have to sort of follow, follow the teaching, you know, just obey. And he's like, hey, I've been doing this since I was a kid. We're good, right? And then Jesus says, no, actually, we're not good. Give away your money. Just follow me. We'll, we'll do cool stuff together. And the guy couldn't do it. So the, and then after that, the apostles go, who can be saved? I don't even understand what, uh, we don't even know what to do now, Right? This is the coolest kid right here. This, is, this kid's probably better than us. We're just fishermen, and this guy, he's rich, and he's religious, and he has his act together, right? And he can't make it, you know? Who can be saved? Who can be saved? Then there's this other guy, and Jesus, Jesus talking about this, this story about this guy who was a hoarder, who made a lot of money and had a lot of grain, and he was building new holding places for his grain and just sort of increasing his wealth. And he was saying, you know, this guy had no idea that to- he's going to die tomorrow and none of it matters. So the guy who was supposed to be a hero in our eyes, they're not heroes at all. They're losers in this new place, in this new, new reality, right? And then he would pick people that were in our minds, if we were there, were me be more on the loser side, you know? <laughs> like he would, he would tell the story. Uh, he, would, he would sit down and people would... They, apparently they had this place where people would give their tithe or their offerings to the temple. And he would literally sit down there and watch how pe- pe- people gave. And it says, he didn't, he didn't watch how, many, how much people gave, but how people gave, right? And, he was up, and then he, he picked from the crowd this, this widow who had nothing, and he had two these mites, right? And mites, is a, in Greek, it's lepta. Lepta, it's the smallest little coin. I actually had a lepta for a while. I actually found it on eBay. There's all kinds of leptas in in because it's like this teeny tiny little coin there was uh, the, the, it cost like six minutes even of labor six minutes of labor is a lepta you know it's like th- it's nothing basically right uh, and then i had a, a lepta in my bible for a while I, when i had a pa- paper bible i still have them at home but i don't use them but uh, uh i just like the electronic thing and uh, i had a lepta sort of taped in there b- to remind me of the heart of this woman who saw money differently right and then I lost the left. I think I gave it to someone. I didn't give, give it back. It's weird, like it's ironic, right? Money, you give something, you know. Yeah, anyway, uh, my left was taken away from me. Anyway, uh, but uh, so he, he picked out this woman, and he gave, she gave everything she had. And she says, she has it right. She has this different heart, this different way of looking at things, right? And uh, so he, he picks these unlikely heroes, right? people that l- look at life and, and money specifically very, very differently. Then he picks this guy who was a tax collector, right? Remember that? His name was Zacchaeus, and he was on a tree, and he was despised by everyone, and he was the guy who basically stole from people. So he was sanctioned to steal from people. He would get the taxes, and he would get more th- than taxes to sort of fill his pockets, and he was just the worst 
You know, people hated him. And then Jesus picks him. He just grabs him and says, you, I'm going to have dinner in your house. And you're going to change, and you're going to see things differently, and your heart will change, you know? And I can imagine myself just standing there in the crowd going, him? Him? Really? This guy, this guy who's been raping this, this village, this, this community of fishermen, of farmers, of people that can barely make ends meet, he will take more than he needs to, to, and give it to the Romans, and then he kept it to himself and make himself, he would cheat? Him? I don't, really? And then, of course, Jesus knew. This guy goes, yes, I'm in. And I will repay the people that I wronged, and I will give away half of what I have and give it to the poor, and I will follow you. And I will see the world differently. I repent. I changed my, my mind, right? So that's why it's so important for us to talk about it. Jesus talked about it. It gets to us. It gets under our skin, doesn't it? You know? This guy, uh, there's this author, um, Guy Kawasaki. Kawasaki, right? Rich, rich, rich dad, poor dad. This very famous author. And he basically talks about, he, uh, I liked that he did this thing he, where he says, there's two ways how money messes with us. Like, there's two ways w how money corrupts us, right? If you have money, you usually, it usually, you start feeling greed, right? If you, if you have money, you, you become greedy. And if you don't have money, it, the same thing, this love for money makes you fear. You've, you have thoughts of fear. Does that make sense? So you fear that you're not going to make the payments, that it's, it's going to go bad, and you're going to lose your job, and you're going to lose your house. And you have all these thoughts of, that have to do with fear and, and anxiety, right? And then th you know the, the terrible thing about be being American is that we are both rich, and we feel greed, and we feel poor at the same time. It's a weird system, isn't it? It's like, how many of you, if you lose your job today, how long will you last? just on your own savings. You know, most Americans will last a month before it's done, right? Think about that. And we're the richest people in the world, 1%. We really are, right? Oh my gosh. So we feel both greed and fear all the time. And it sort of creeps into under our skin. Now, This, here's another observation. This is all random thoughts. I'm rambling a little bit, but the, the Bible was written to an audience, especially Old Testament and New Testament as well, that was really the vast majority of the audience of the Bible were Jews and then Gentiles, but it was basically very poor people, the vast majority. And all of them oppressed. All of them. Some of them enslaved. Some of them slaves. They don't have freedom at all. all m the vast majority oppressed. Right? People that were in exile, people that were crucified, people that were occupied, people that were humiliated, people that are done. That's why the Bible speaks a lot about that, right? And Jesus talks about the poor and the hungry and the oppressed, right? And when we read the Bible, we read that same text, and we go, yeah, I shouldn't be down. Like, I shouldn't be down. I should believe in God, and he will up and, and hold me up, and he'll take care of me, and that kind of thing. And it's true, and it's all true. But what we forget to, to think is that it's like if we are reading the Bible as the Romans would read the Bible. We are the Romans in this scenario. Right? We're the Romans with a house, with security, with a 401k, with the ability to purchase this and this and this, to basically have a f pretty safe, pretty well-fed, well-dressed, taken care of, comfortable life. Right? That's who we are. That's who we are when we read the Bible. And we just don't, we don't put the two and two together. That it, it just, it's read differently from our perspective. And we should be aware. Now, should we feel bad about it? We should be grateful, right? But it's good to be aware, isn't it? it? It's good to be aware. So 
we had the, uh, I think, the, the, do you, did you follow the news last week about the Powerball that became this thing? <laughs> did you have thoughts about it? Just be honest. Who didn't have thoughts? I totally had thoughts about it. <laughs> it's like 1.5 billion or something like that. That's the Powerball. And did you not have thoughts about it? Now that is proof that it gets under our skin, right? Like there's something in this, in the easy money, in this once in a, in a you know, 50 million, I don't know what it is, what the chances are, that got me, like I'm driving around, I listen to, it's just here, it's just a splatter of news there and there that just became this massive thing. And you just go, should I buy a ticket? <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> it would just so help me. I'm, and I really had these thoughts. I was like, if I buy a ticket, what if God like chooses me? <laughs> because he knows I would give most of it away. I really, and I really would. I'm like, what if I'm not buying the ticket and he's, not, and he's like going, dude, I would totally give it to you. <laughs> you know, like all these thoughts, <laughs> you know, <laughs> driving around, <laughs> all these thoughts. And you <laughs> and, but it's, it's, it's there, right? And then you read somebody, Dave, Dave Hooper uh, sent me this email with basically all these stories. There's like probably two dozen stories of people that won the lottery. And all of them were like a wreck. It was horrible. I, you know, it's just terrible. And you don't, and, and, and you start sort of realizing that it's just, we just don't know what we ask for. We don't know what we wish for. And when we get it, some, somehow, it, some, it can just does destroy us, right? So I know why I'm not rich. I just couldn't handle it. <laughs> God is good. God is good to me. Because, because he knows I would be probably a wreck of some sort, you know, one sort or, or another. In... Um, <coughs> You know, when, when Russia got their freedom, people that were sort of smart and crap, you know, there's, a, there's actually a word in Russian that there doesn't exist in, in English. Th this word is hitri. Hitri. And there's no word in English for hitri. And it's basically sort of a mix between crafty and smart. That's, it's sort of, that's the best. And, and it's, it's a positive word. It's like, Good for you. You're hitri. You know, and in, in when when the country sort of fell apart, there was so much open opportunity that some people rushed in, the hitri people, and they banked big, right? So people that were my age, that had nothing like six, five years prior, in about '95, some of them were billionaires. You know. And it was like, it was just crazy to, to be, to witness that, right? To be, okay, so you and I, were both like nobodies, you know, like living in this crappy apartment, like eating bad food, not being able to live the, live the country, you know, this terrible, I mean, I hated it. I hate the Soviet Union. Uh, I actually campaigned against the communists, and that's a whole different story. We won. Mm. <laughs> but... So I was with this guy who was doing, dealing in metals and things like that, and we were having coffee, and, and he goes, you know what, I like you. I was a struggling musician. I was like in my mid-20s. And he, and he shows up in my little apartment. It was like a one-bedroom. And he gives me $100,000 in cash. He has like two, three bodyguards waiting by the elevator doing this, <laughs> you know. And he walks in. I'm like, what is this? And he literally goes, like, here you go. Man. Just do something with it, you know. I'm like, okay, so is this a loan? Is this, you know, what's the, what's the catch? He goes, there's no catch. Just, I like you. You know, think about that, right? And I the guy gave me $100,000, right? And that's, that's how crazy it got, right? On a, there was another story, and this, I wouldn't have believed it unless a friend of mine with his own eyes had witnessed the story. He lives in this sur suburban, sort of higher end sort of place. He's, in, he's in, in show business, my friend. And he sort of walks over. He says, I walk over to my, to, my, to my neighbor because it was his birthday, and he sort of invited me over for a little meal. You know, he goes, well, let's come over. We'll do a little something, something, you know. It's my birthday. He walks in, and there's like 30 people sitting at the table uh, celebrating his birthday, and there was somebody playing on stage, and it was Sting. Sting was playing this guy's birthday. And my friend tells me, I'm like, I'm wearing like a track suit, <laughs> thinking we're going to have a little, you know, drink a little vodka, you know. 
and I'm sitting at a table and Sting is playing the birthday. And he says, I witness, he says, I could have just, I, this is like a parallel reality. He goes, the guy, my friend, paid him a million dollars to come and play the birthday. And then, and this is, not, oh, this is not the end of the story, that's the funny part, right? He came over and he gave him a tip. He tipped Sting. <laughs> Let that sink in. His friend tipped Sting a million dollars. And he says, you did good. You know, like, can you imagine yourself going, Sting? That was good. Here's a little something, something for you. Just, you know, a little cash, just some change, you know. Buy yourself something good. So, so that's how it went, you know. That's what, that's what happens, right? And this is, of course, out, way outside of our realm, but it's true, you know. Now, when, when Jesus came, and, and, and he talked about two things. He talked about money a lot, but he talked about the kingdom more than anything. And the funny thing is there's this connection. Because he talks about the kingdom in financial terms. Have you noticed that? He talks about the kingdom in financial terms. Then you think about it. Why, if money is evil, is, if, if all of that is evil and bad, why would he even bother? Why would he sort of condescend to, to this topic, this lowly topic? and sort of connected to the kingdom of heaven. And it's very telling, right? So he says the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in the field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, went and sold all he had and bought the field. And then he gives another example. He, again, the kingdom of heaven, again, meaning, let me tell you just a, let me tell you the same thing, only a slightly different way, but tell you the, I'm telling you the same thing. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. So he's, there's this pattern. He's, he talks about the kingdom of heaven in financial terms. And he talks about this very specific thing you would do if you understand the, 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 the kingdom of heaven. What you would do is you would divest from something, give it away, get rid of something and invest in something different, right? Does that make sense? The new treasure replaces the old treasure. There's more value, and replaces, it replaces the lesser value. That is the kingdom. It forces out love of money. And money's not bad. Money's a great servant. It's a bad, bad master. Right? But it replaces it. It's a kingdom worldview. It's repentance. And he reiterates it. He says, you know, you can't have it both ways. He goes, no one can serve two masters. No one. No one. Not you, not I, nor the Pope. No one can serve two masters. It's you can't have it both ways. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. So if you, in your heart, go, yeah, I, I love money. I want to get rich. And then you have the buts. You know, I'll do this with it and that with it and this with this and that with it. And if it's idolatry, you will lose the kingdom. That is the promise. And it's great to be entrepreneurial. It's great to be wise. It's great to be ambitious. This is awesome. But the minute it becomes this idol, you're done. You can't be a Christian. You won't be able to, it's not, it, someone's going to push you out or kick you out. Actually, they did kick people out for greed. Did you know that? First Corinthians 5, one of the lists of things, there's like a short list of things where you, where you kick people out of the church. That's what Paul says. And one of them is greed. I don't even know how they sort of measured that, right? Like I've never, I've been a church leader for 18 years. I've never kicked somebody out for greed. Like, I keep wanting to. Like, just because I could say, I could, you know, we're doing it like the Bible is, you know. But I, I honestly don't even know how to go about it, you know. Maybe I'm just corrupted myself and, you know, I live in this fallen state and stuff, you know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how they did it. But it's one of the things that they kick people out of. Wrong. But really, most of it, well, I think what Jesus means is, if you are 
if you're consumed by greed or fear, and, and you, can be, you can love money and, idol uh, and be an idolater of money, even if you don't have money, which is like the worst kind of idolatry, right? Like, it's probably better to, idol to, be, to be an idolater of money if you at least have a lot of it. <laughs> you know, I don't know. At least you can ride in a helicopter and have lunch somewhere, you know? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, in my mind, I'm not rich, so I, I'm like, well, it's a little bit better, I think, you know? But when you don't have it, and you are, and you, so you don't have it, and you're gripped with fear all the time. That's like the terrible thing, right? It's just my theory. But it basically says you can't serve two things. You just can't serve two things. You can't do it. Now, how do you diagnose <coughs> love of money? And this is today, I, I, this is a reminder. Today we're talking about the why. Why it's important to go there. For you to go there to go look into your heart, look into your lifestyle, look around, find your spot. Where are you? And actually identify where you are with money. How do you think about it? Are, is it healthy? Is it not healthy? Why? Right? It's because it can destroy you. And it could prevent you from seeing the kingdom that is near. Yeah? So how do you diagnose? <coughs> well, First of all, this is, if you don't diagnose, and if you don't change, if you don't repent, and you have that in your heart, and you could be a member of the church, not a member of the church, and by the way, we can be an idolater outside of the church, or an idolater inside the church. Easy. As a matter of fact, you can be an idolater in the morning, and, not, and then repent by evening. Have you experienced that ever? Yeah, I, I experienced that. I experienced that. I catch myself going, I am anxious right now, worried about the future. And then I repent, and I go, that's stupid. God, is, Jesus is Lord, and I will rely on him now. And you can be like that. You can be like that five times a day. But sometimes you're just sort of soaked in it. You're, like, su you're sunk so low that you can't even see that, and that's a dangerous place to be. And what's going to happen is, if you love money, you will anchor your identity in it. And that will mess you up. Because if you do well, you'll feel better about yourself. If you, if you don't do well financially, you'll feel worse about yourself. And there's no reason for you to feel worse about yourself if you don't have money. The widow that gave the two mites, who Jesus uplifted and admired so much, had nothing. And imagine if she, if she connected her identity, her value and her worth, to her financial situation. That would be stupid. That would be dumb. And that would be untrue. Does that make sense? And how, much, how many of us are tempted to connect our identity and our goodness and our worthiness to how much, how, how much money we make and how short we are this month? And I think many of us, all of us, are tempted. That's how important it is. And what you end up doing, if you connect your identity to money, if you idolize money, if you love money, you're going to start buying things that you don't need. You're going to be purchasing things on impulse. Then you're going to have debt that is too much, right? And then because you have debt that is too much, you'll end up working on jobs you don't like and hanging out with people you don't like, right? And then you won't get to do so many things. You won't, you won't get to have the time you want to do other things. You won't get to serve your community the way you want to. You, don't want, you won't get to do the entrepreneurial, the creative, the generous stuff that you've always dreamt to do. The, the, the stuff that gives you life. Because you are paying for a lifestyle, for a lifestyle that imprisoned you, that enslaved you over time. And sometimes you can repent and you still have to pay for five more years. And that's terrible, right? Do you have five years to repay stuff? To pay for your sins? You don't want that, right? <laughs> and how can you diagnose? So this is how you diagnose that, you have, that you're struggling with money issues. You either have greed, and you only you know how that feels, right? Only you know that's there and how much of it is there. Or... You have fear. You have a lot of fear. You, you're anxious about your bills. 
about your month, about next month, about losing your job, about your savings, about all that. You have fear. You let fear control you. So if you have either one of those things, you have to repent. You have to look into it. You have to look at Jesus, and you have to figure out and struggle with it and wrestle with it. And you have to see the kingdom is here and change the way you think. This is the why. This is why this is important, right? And if you're not in that place, if you're in a good place, this is what you'll experience. Remember the, the guys, the guy with the, with the field, who bought the field? What did he do? He divested from something, he invested in something else. And how did he do it? In his joy. In his joy. It's a joyful thing. Repentance, it's a joyful thing. When you, I highly recommend repentance. I really do. Because it's difficult in the beginning, but it's supremely joyful in the end. Because it's hard to face who you really are in a bad place that you're in. But when you shift your, your, your view to Jesus and the kingdom and this new freedom and this new reality, there's nothing better than repentance, right? Have you ever repent, repented and gone, I, I want more of this? Until you forget how it feels and you don't want to repent anymore, right? So if you're in a place where you don't love money, but you, you see the kingdom, you have a lot of joy. And you might be in that place, and I'm so happy for you, right? Please share to the person of you, to your left and your right how you got there, right? How did you get there? So, buy the field. Buy the field. Seriously. Buy the field. All in. Divest from the love of money. And please, by all means, make a lot of money. But divest from the love of money. And buy the field. The kingdom is here. The kingdom is here. And not grabbing it, not going, oh, I'm going to sell everything. I'm going to get this field. It's a treasure. It's like being in post-Soviet Union and staying in a little stupid apartment and not buying better food and not traveling to Greece and not exercising this new freedom. That's what, it, that is, that's what it's like. And many of us live there. And Jesus looks at us and goes, Why? Why would you be gripped with fear? Why would you walk away and live, walk, walk around and live in greed? Why would you be anxious? Stop being anxious. The kingdom is here. The kingdom is here. Amen? So this is the why, amen? And then we're going to about, talk about the, the what and the how next uh, two Sundays.